Hey guys, my name is Neil Whiteley. I am co-owner of Catalyst Machine Works and MoneyShotCinema.com. I'm also the designer and developer of this creation here. This is the Money Shot Mini. This is our scene lifter. And this is actually the second version of the machine. So this is the V2. And the V2 is a Y6. It's got six motors, six props. The V1 was an X8, as you probably already know. Um, this is a user manual, so this is a video user, user manual for the machine. Now, once you get yours in-house, please have some patience. Don't go out and think you know how to use it and just make some assumptions and start flying. Please watch this video all the way through, regardless of how boring it is. Um, if you have any questions, you can email us at info at catalystmachineworks.com or support at catalystmachineworks.com. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, once you get it in, the very first thing you're going to want to do is charge up some batteries so you can put power through this and bind to the air unit and then bind your radio to the machine. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that now. So we need to get bound up to this machine, but before doing that, we've got to charge up some batteries. Okay, so I'm going to explain the procedure for uh, charging your batteries up, what kind of plugs need to be on these, and how it all works. Okay, so... There are two versions of the machine. There is an 8S and a 12S version. Um, I happen to have a couple of 4S packs here. These are 8,000 milliamp hour high C rated 4S packs. And what we do is we wire these in series so that we can get 8S. Same thing with your 12S machine. You're going to use a couple of 6S battery packs and then wire them in series. Now, when you receive your batteries in from the manufacturer, they're not gonna have these AS150s uh, wired up like this. So you're gonna have to do this. Uh, if you don't wanna do it yourself, you don't wanna mess with it, we can do it for you. So we can source the batteries or you can have the batteries sent to us, however you wanna do it. And then we can wire these up and then ship them off to you. They're really super easy. But if you wanna do it, here's how to do it. Okay, so this battery here, what we've got is a short, negative lead that has a female AS150. Okay, you see that? And then we've got a long positive lead that's got a male AS150. And this has got the anti-spark connector in it. Okay, what that means, let me show you. The anti-spark is that little ring right there. So that stops it whenever you plug this thing into your machine, it stops that pop. Okay, it's not gonna spark. Then, on the other battery, what you're going to do is have a long negative lead with a male AS150. Okay. Then you're going to have a short positive lead with a male AS150. Okay. And the way that this thing works is you join these like this. Now, these went from 4S batteries into an 8S battery set. And then these guys plug into your bird. All right, so how do we charge it up? Well, what we do is we provide you guys with these charge adapters. All right, there's two, and they're different because these, the wiring here is different. Okay, so what we're gonna do is take our batteries here, pretty simple, figure out which set goes to which adapter, plug it in like so, all right, and take the other one, plug it in, and there you go, and then you can hook these up to your, uh, to your charger and charge them up, okay, so once these things are fully charged, we can then mount them into the bird, and I'll show you how to do that, but before that, I'd like to mention that if you want to have the ability to charge multiple sets of batteries out in the field at one time, you're going to need extra charge adapters. Uh, and so we can sell you extra sets, not a problem. However many you may need. Okay, so let's show you how to connect this guy up to your bird. All right, I've got it flipped over. And on the bottom, you'll notice that there is a quick release. It's a toolless quick release to get the tray off. So you just push this and the tray comes off. 
So let's get the bird out of the way. Okay, to mount your batteries up, what you've got to do is get some dual lock Velcro. So you see I've got it here on the bottom, really important. So put them on all your batteries and then mount some dual lock to the tray. I don't have any mounted up here because I don't happen to have any with me. Um, but you could imagine that I've got my dual lock on there. So go ahead and take these off like this. All right, Get your battery straps open. Okay, now whenever you mount this up, what you want to do is make sure that you're missing these so there's little uh, pins that are going to run through these little slots there. You want to make sure that you've got your batteries out of the way. All right. Now we've got the battery pack sets on the tray and we're ready to go. You'll notice that the little quick release hook is facing the opposite direction from the plugs. All right. Put it in here like this. There you go. Now the battery tray is permanently mounted. It's not going anywhere. It won't come off. Okay, so to power up this bird, what we do, connect these. Okay, over here, we've got a negative AS150 on the machine. Plug that in. Then over here, we've got our positive. So once you plug this in, She's powered up, okay? So now I'm gonna go ahead and talk about how to bind to this machine now that we have the ability to put power through it. All right, so let's go ahead and bind our goggles up to the machine. So what's compatible are the DJI goggles. You can use either the version one or the version two. So first thing you wanna do is go and find the little red button right here. We'll bind that and we'll hit that. You may have to hit it twice to start its beeping. It's annoying beeping. Now that you've got the annoying beeping going on, let's put power through the machine. Now, you're gonna find the little button to bind to the air unit right in here. It's gonna be kinda of hard. I don't know if it's gonna be picked up in this video here, but you're gonna see it. It's right in there. And what I do is take something that is got a pretty small end on it, so something that you can poke at it with. What I found to work really well is a capacitor. Just take a capacitor and sort of, you know, join these together, spin the little leads together and then bend the end of it and that allows you to get it bent in there and hit that little button. You don't really have to jam it in there because you'll, you'll mess it up if you jam it too hard. Just get it in there and just barely boop, just hit it. All right, so I'm gonna do that now. There we go. So that means that we now have a full video and we are good to go. So now let's go ahead and bind your radio to the machine. Something I forgot to mention about the battery trays and how they're intended to work. Okay, let me pull the battery tray off so I can discuss it. Right, so the way that this is supposed to work is that for each battery set you have, you have a battery tray. 
and they're intended to stay together as a as a set and you don't take them apart okay so you could imagine let's say that you had six different sets of batteries one two three four five six what you would do is have one battery tray for each set go ahead and mount them up like this and just keep them together so that way when you're out in the field when you're on set it's super quick to change out your battery tray right so you've got or your batteries rather you've got an exhausted pack you hit the toolless quick release you unplug pull it out then you take your new one and put it in and then uh, plug it in and you're done that stops you from having to screw around with battery straps and fumble around with the batteries and taking them off and everything um, it's way faster to do it if you've got a, a battery tray for each battery set and it looks much more professional on set and it's just much more efficient so that's how it's supposed to work my friends we are going to go ahead and bind radio to the machine now this bird uh, will communicate with any crossfire capable radio I happen to have an X9D right here with a crossfire module in the rear um, but you can use a Tango you can use that new Ethix thing you know there, there's a radio master there's actually a bunch of different uh, radios now that have crossfire protocol alright so any of those will work um, I am not going to go into the specifics of the actual bind process all right all I'm going to do is show you how to access the bind button on the receiver if you don't know how to bind crossfire by now you really shouldn't be purchasing one of these machines to be honest okay so let's go ahead and show you now how to get into this bird and access the bind button all right so to get into this thing truth be told it takes a little bit of time it's maybe going to take about five minutes to get into it. Um, yeah, hey, maybe it's a little bit of a pain in the butt <laughs> to get into the receiver, um, if I'm going to be totally honest. But you do it one time and it's done, okay? Um, and it's not really hard. You just have to remove some screws to get in there. So what you're going to want to do is remove all of these screws here for the uh, anti-vibration dampers. And we're going to take off this entire anti-vibration plate okay so here's the screws I'm talking about unscrewing all of those taking all those out I'm gonna do that off camera so I don't bore the heck out of you guys and when I come back poof it will be done all right I've taken all the screws and loosened them up and what you want to do once you've got them all completely loose is just take and lift this up straight up like that the gummies are really sort of sticky and so everything will just kind of stick together it's not going to come apart <clears throat> if you've done it right and there you go oh and this gives me a good chance to uh to show you guys you see these sliders here so what you can do if you want to move the position of your camera mount is just loosen these six screws that hold the camera mount to this plate and then you can slide the camera mount back and forth and get the positioning right all right so we've got that removed let's put it away and then here's the top so what we want to do is take out these eight screws here holding this plate taking all the screws out so now we can take this plate pull it off and then you can see you now have access to the receiver see if I can get this in camera and the receiver is right here okay you have plenty of easy access to the bind button right and so you should know the uh, procedure to bind your radio to the uh, to the receiver so once you've got it bound just do the process in reverse put the plate back on put your anti-vibration assembly back on and you are now bound to the craft one thing I do want to mention about <clears throat> putting the anti-vibration assembly back on is that when you screw these uh, down here all you do is get it on get it uh, just snug right so you don't crank the heck out of it watch this that's it 
So just screw it down until it stops. You feel resistance and then give it a little bit more. You don't have to over torque these. It's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna work out for you if you do. Just uh, make sure and get them all snug. It's not gonna go anywhere and that's, uh, that's the way that it's designed to work. All right, so you are bound to the craft. You've got your radio on. You are connected into the remote USB port, which is located right here. And what you need to do is go ahead and download iNav. All right, so I've got the most current version of iNav installed on my computer. And then uh, go ahead and connect in to the machine. So here we go. I'm moving around the bird. You can see it's going to move around on the graphic there. So the first thing that we need to do is go to the receiver tab. Move around your, your sticks. I don't happen to have my radio on right now, but move around your sticks. Make sure that roll, pitch, yaw, and throttle are corresponding correctly. If they're not, let's say, for instance, you move throttle and you get roll moving. Well, what you need to do most likely is just go into channel map and start messing around with these different maps and you'll probably find one that matches, okay, that, that maps the correct uh, movements of your sticks to these bars here, okay? So once you've got everything mapped correctly, the next thing you need to do is go to the modes tab and set up your modes. <clears throat> now, this is the part about the machine that you really need to take care with. Okay, you really need to think this part out, take your time, and get familiar with this. There's actually quite a bit going on here uh, with these different modes and these different new functions that we've got with the Money Shot V2. Okay, obviously this is running iNAP, so it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a quite a bit more complex than Betaflight in our first money shot. All right, so here are the modes that you want to set up. We want to have arm. We want to have pre-arm. Navigation return to home. Navigation position hold. Navigation altitude hold. And these are actually going to be on the same channel. Okay. You're going to have air mode. And that's it. We don't want you changing any of these, you know, adding any of these extra modes like angle, horizon, any of this extra stuff. If you add any of this extra stuff, well, you void your warranty. I mean, you can do it if you want to, but you're going to void your warranty. So these are the only modes that we want you to, to add, to use. Okay. So, uh, so you're going to need this many channels, one, two, three, four, because these two are linked, and then five. Okay, so now you can, of course, go ahead and move your sliders around. So let's say that you've got arm on a three-position switch, which is actually what we suggest. We suggest to not put it on a two-position switch, but put it on a three-position switch and have the position that arms the craft sitting in the center. And the reason for that is that if you flip your switch accidentally, what's going to happen is you're either going to go from, you know, one extreme to the next. So you're going to pass right past arm. Okay, so you're not accidentally going to arm it. <clears throat> so there we go. There's that. Now we also got pre-arm that's on a different channel. We've got navigation, return to home that's on a different channel. These two are linked together. You can see how I've got them both on channel six. And they're linked together. So whenever you switch this, it not only is it holding your navigation heading or sort of your location on the XY plane, it's also working to hold your altitude. Okay, and then we've also got air mode. Now, some of you may not be familiar with air mode uh, because on beta flight, a lot of you guys probably fly beta flight. Air mode is something that, you know, is, is kind of like a default setting. 
But what air mode does is it keeps your PID loop active at zero throttle. Okay, so if you go to zero throttle, uh, it is allowing you to still have control of the craft. So let's say that you do a split S and you dump throttle all the way to zero, you can still move and control that machine. If you don't have air mode active, when you go to zero throttle, you lose control. You don't have any control of, of, the, of the bird, okay? I'm gonna talk about the various functions and how they should be set up on your radio. Now, you can decide what switches you want to use and where they're going to be located for the various functions of the craft. However, it is important that ARM be in a specific location uh, so that you don't accidentally disarm this thing while you're flying it. Let me explain. Okay, so what I mean by that is I'm going to show you where we suggest to put the arm switch. Um, here's my radio, and what I like to do is put the arm switch on a three position switch. And again, the reason I'm using a three position switch is that let's say I accidentally hit it. Well, when you accidentally hit something, you're gonna go like that. It's gonna go from one extreme to the other, one side of the throw to the other. If you put your arm in the center of the three position switch well then you're in a good you're in a good spot if you accidentally hit that switch because you're never going to arm it or disarm it right you're going to go like that it's going to go right past the middle position so that's a bit of safety that you can use there now another safety protocol is where your arm switch is in reference to all of the other functions of the craft you don't want to be flying and accidentally, you know, let's say you're like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do a position hold. And you go to your position hold, which is back here, and you accidentally somehow disarm the craft, and it falls out of the sky. <laughs> you don't want that. So what you can do, let's say that I decided to put all of my different functions over here. So we have, you know, return to home, uh, position hold, air mode. They're all on this side, on these switches. And then I've got arm and pre-arm all alone over here, all by themselves. That's probably a good idea. Up to you, but that's the way that we like to do it. Now again, you can put all of your different switches for all your different modes wherever you'd like on your radio. Uh, and you might take some time to really think that out. Uh, I do suggest to label them and get familiar with where they are because in the heat of the moment let's say that you I'll give you a for instance let's say in the heat of the moment you're out there flying for a job and you go behind a building and lose video signal well what can you do to save yourself from crashing all that expensive equipment well you can do position hold bam position hold now you're holding in place you can run over on the other side of the building and get video back and you can save the thing or you could do return to home let's say i had it set right here oh my god i lost video bam hit return to home it's gonna raise to altitude come right back and land where it took off okay so knowing where your switches are is super super important All right now i'm going to go through each mode or each function and talk about them in detail one by one this is the part of the video that's really super important to pay attention to. Um, I know it's boring, <laughs> but I'm trying to do my best to give you guys the information you need to know to operate this thing safely. So please do watch uh, this, this entire portion. Okay, so let's talk about pre-arm and arm. Again, what I like to do is take and put those away from the other switches. So for instance, we could put pre-arm here so what you got to do is hit that first before it'll arm. That's an extra bit of safety. Then I've got arm on this three position switch in the middle. Okay, so there we go. Pre-arm and arm. Now the craft is armed. The, the craft is armed. Can't speak correctly. Okay, so we are armed. We're spinning and we need to talk about air mode. Okay, air mode works differently 
on iNav than it does on Betaflight. You may be familiar with air mode on Betaflight and the way that it functions. Um, it does the same thing on iNav, but it kind of behaves in a different way. And what I mean by that is this. Let me grab the craft. Okay, here we go. Now, let's say that I have armed it. Okay, so pre-arm, arm. Now the motors are spinning up. You could imagine the motors are spinning up. Um, if I've got air mode active, so let's say hypothetically this switch for me is air mode. Okay, I've got air mode active. What happens when this thing is on the ground is you can hear the motors slowly start to increase speed. <laughs> uh, they just sort of continually increase RPM and if you hold it there long enough until the point to where this thing starts to get light in its feet. Okay, so what we suggest is to hit air mode after you take off. All right, so once you have gotten this thing up in the air, whoop, you, you start to, to, to rise up and, and gain some altitude, hit air mode. Now the reverse is, uh, is, is true for landing it. Before landing, we suggest to go ahead and turn off air mode. Okay, Just makes it easier to land. Uh, because what happens when you turn off air mode in iNav is that this range here, this 10% range, kills the PID loop. So it basically brings the motors down to very slow rotational speed and you, you lose control of the PID loop. So what that means is that before you land, if you turn off air mode, it basically, once you bring your throttle down past that 10%, threshold, it just sets the thing down. There's no, there's none of air mode can tend to sort of want to bobble the thing around and it's sort of active. The PID loop is trying to figure what, figure out what's going on and it just is uneasy on the ground. So turn off air mode, it'll set down nice and easy and you can then go ahead and disarm. Okay, another thing that we need to, uh, to really stress is the importance of having air mode on in the event you're going to do some FPV type maneuvers. Okay, so let's say for instance, you are going to dive a building. Well, when you dive a building, you're gonna to go to the top of the thing and you're gonna fall down the side, like this probably, <laughs> and uh, you're gonna bring throttle down to zero at some point, most likely. Well, if you don't have air mode active, and you bring throttle down to zero, now your PID loop is killed, is dead, and you have no control over the craft. And you're gonna notice it'll just sort of slow, if you're moving in this direction, it'll just continue to go, and you have no control. So, it's a good idea with an FPV machine, once you get up in the air, to always have air mode active. If you wanna do a split S, and you go over, and you're doing your split S, and you're upside down and you hit zero throttle and air mode isn't active, well, you have no control. <laughs> so again, I'm sorry to keep repeating it, but I wanna really beat it into your brain. When you get up in the air, make sure to activate air mode. It's position hold slash altitude hold. And as I, I showed you in iNav, those two sliders are linked together, so I think we had them on channel six. They're linked together so that when you, let's say that we've got position hold right here, okay? It's just hypothetically, you can put it wherever you want. But let's say that's position hold. So what that's doing is it's holding the altitude, so you're not raise, you know, dropping altitude or increasing in altitude, and it's also holding your position on the XY plane, so in this direction. All right, now what's cool about altitude hold, 
or I'm sorry, position hold, altitude hold, whatever you want to call it. For the, for the remainder here, I'm going to just call it position hold. All right? For what's cool about position hold is that you can change location. So this is kind of like the DJI way of doing things uh, with position hold is that you can change location. So let's say that you, you get it into a location uh, and you're getting ready for the shoot and then the director says, ah, oh, no, crap, we got to do this, that, and this, and the other. Hold on for a couple minutes uh, and then move your location to over there. Well, what you can do is you can keep it in position hold, move location, okay, fly it to a new location, let go, and now it's going to hold its position in a new location. So that's really, really super cool. I love that function. Okay. Now here's something else you need to know about position hold. It is tied to your throttle. So what happens in position hold is that if your throttle is below 50%, this thing is going to start dropping altitude slowly, very slowly. It'll keep dropping altitude. If your stick is above 50%, it'll start slowly increasing in altitude, okay? So, to keep it locked, you need to keep throttle at 50%, okay? And so what's probably a good idea to do whenever you release position hold is to have throttle just a little bit above 50% and then release, and then release position hold. So keep that in mind. And this is a good thing to play with before you get out there and start to do a job, uh, you know, for exchange of money, is play with all of these functions. Play with position hold. Play with return to home. Get, get familiar with them. Understand how they work. You don't want it to be a surprise. I'm going to talk about return to home. This is one uh, that is really super cool. We have used it quite a bit, and it, it, it can be pretty handy. I do want you to keep in mind, though, it's not a magic catch-me-all. It's not, if you get into a sticky situation, it's not always going to save your ass. <laughs> There's a lot of different scenarios flying these machines, and while it is a nice safety feature, it isn't a 100% you know, foolproof. Um, I'll give you a for instance, you know, if you if you set return to home and you have something in your path, well, you're just going to hit it <laughs> and crash. So before you get up in the air, it's important to really figure out your environment, um, figure out the shooting scenario and figure out the height of the different elements in the environment. On return to home, how it works is when you go out and you set your machine down in a location, and that's where you're going to take off, the GPS determines its location by way of satellites. So it's figuring out where, where it's setting. And so when you take off, and let's say you hit return to home, it returns right back to that location. And the, what it does is, let's say that you are flying, I don't know, 20 feet uh, from the ground. And you hit return to home. Well, this thing ascends to the preset uh, height. And what we have by default in iNav is 5,000 centimeters. I have no idea why the iNav developers decided to use centimeters. <laughs> but they did. So we set it at 5,000 centimeters. Uh, that seems like a pretty pretty good height, you know, just in, in general scenario. Um, and so it goes up to the altitude, spins around in the direction it needs to travel home, travels home nice and slow and steady, stops, turns around in the orientation that it took off, and slowly descends until it hits the ground. And if air mode is off, it will disarm itself. If air mode is not off, you have to disarm it. So that's how return to home works. So now you can imagine once you get out to the field, let's say that it's not a field. Let's say that it's a uh, middle of a downtown. 
okay, it's downtown Austin, Texas, for instance, and you've got some pretty high buildings that are much higher than 5,000 centimeters, but lower than 400 feet, okay, uh, what you can do is you can go into iNav, and that's really the only setting <laughs> in, in that entire software other than your rates that we allow you to change without voiding your warranty. And so here is where you find that in iNav. Okay, so the return to home altitude can be located in the advanced tuning section. And here it is right here. Return to home altitude in unit of measure centimeters. We've got it set to 5,000. Let's say that you determine the highest building in your shooting environment is 7,000, for instance, or it's 6,000. You can put it 1,000 centimeters over that. And you know that if, God forbid, you were to have a fail safe, you lost connection to the bird from your radio, or you had some sort of video issue and you manually hit return to home, that that thing is going to rise up above the highest, the highest element in your shooting environment and fly home and land and be nice and safe and not run into anything. Okay, so we allow you to change this to whatever you want. Obviously, you don't want to put it, you know, to 10 centimeters or something ridiculous like that because then you're just going to be skimming across the ground and, and probably crash. So make sure that you've got, you know, some, some reasonable altitude for this setting. While we're on the subject of what values in INAV we allow you to change without voiding your warranty, let's go into PID tuning. We also allow you to change your rates. Okay, so here's where you can change your rates. All these values here. You can change your expo. Now, we've got it set at a, 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 a set of values that we believe works very well for, for most people. But, of course, everybody's different. And so you have the liberty to change these to your liking. All right, let's talk about fail-safe. So in the event, God forbid, of a failsafe, let's say that for some god-awful reason, your radio loses connection to the bird, well, iNav is going to automatically uh, go into return to home procedure. So it's going to try and figure out if it's going to receive a signal and reestablish that. If it doesn't, all of a sudden it starts returning to home. So it's important that the altitude setting that you can go into iNav and set and that the location that you launched from, those two things are good to go. So always be thinking about a worst case scenario. Okay, if this thing were to fail safe, where is this thing gonna come home and land at? And also, what is my environment like? Are the trees super high? Is, are the buildings super high? You know, is my altitude setting above those things? You have to have those things in mind every single time you fly this in the event of a fail safe. You're bound to the machine. Everything is ready to go in the software. You're communicating correctly. And now it is finally time to put on your props. So uh, the way that these props go on is the front two, front two motors are spinning clockwise, okay? They're spinning clockwise. The rear motor on the top is spinning counterclockwise. Okay, so top motors, the rear is counterclockwise, the front two are clockwise. Go ahead and use the uh, little washers that come with your motors. Something very important I want to mention about torquing down these nuts to hold your props on is you do not want to put an excessive amount of torque into this nut to hold the prop on. Just because this is a large machine does not mean that you need to put an equally large amount of torque on here. Okay? You just need to get, get it to where it stops, okay? and then crank it a little more. There is a, on these motors, as you can see, the knurling is quite significant. 
So we've got a nice knurled surface here that really grabs that prop. So you don't need to over torque it. It is possible if you take and you continue to just torque down on this nut that you can actually break this shaft. All right, these are hollow shafts, they're very strong, but they're not strong enough. I've seen people take a big lever arm, a big wrench, and they think, oh my God, this is a big craft. I better really crank these nuts down to hold these big old props on here. And they just do this. And they keep going around and keep going around. And bam, they'll pop that shaft. You don't want to do that. So just get it on there and get it snug um, and you'll be good to go. Two thumbs up. All right, we're moving on to the bottom, bottom set of props. So you can imagine obviously that they're going to be counter rotating. Okay, so the top are going uh, in the rear. The top are going counterclockwise. So the bottom and the rear is going to go clockwise. Okay, then obviously for the front, if the top and the front are going clockwise, the bottom is going to go counterclockwise. Put those on here. There we go. All right, now, when you, when you uh, arm her for the first time and try and get it in the air, if your props are on wrong, you're gonna know it immediately because <laughs> it's gonna do some wild things that you're not gonna like. Uh, so make sure that you've got it right. Um, I'm gonna go over it just one last time just to make sure that we've got it. So in the front, on the top, the two front uh, are going clockwise. The rear on the top is going counterclockwise. The rear on the bottom is going clockwise. And then the front on the bottom, those are both going counterclockwise. And before we get up in the air, got to make sure and put our antennas on. There are two of these. It's going to come in your, in your uh, kit with these most likely disconnected. So we're just going to thread them onto the SMA threads here. And uh, you can just use your fingers actually to get it nice and snug. They're not going to come out if you tighten it enough. Now we suggest that if you're traveling with these antennas connected, you go to your next spot, your next chute, go ahead and make sure that these are nice and tight. It's possible that they could have loosened in travel or what have you. And if these uh, are loose in flight, you're not going to have good reception. Um, and you may lose your video feed if they were to, God forbid, come off. So make sure that these are tight before every single flight. All right, let's talk about the camera mount assembly, um, how that works, how you mount your camera up. So to change the angle on this, it's pretty self-explanatory. You're going to loosen these screws here. And then you can, you can change the angle to whatever you want. We've got little numbers on here that show the different angles. And there is a little pin right there that sticks out so you can see exactly what angle you've got on your cinema camera. Now when you tighten these screws, you don't need to really go crazy and, 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 and torque the crap out of them. Just get them nice and snug. There's a couple of uh, Nordlock washers in here that help to uh, stop the screw from backing out in flight. So let's say I've got it set. We're good with that. We can go ahead and torque these down. Okay, now this leads me to the FPV camera. As you can see, it's a similar situation. We've got little numbers laser etched into this aluminum piece that match up to these two carbon fiber pointers. 
So you can see exactly what angle you've got the FPV camera at. So a lot of people like to take and match the FPV camera angle to the cinema camera angle. So you can do that. And obviously to change it, you just need a little screwdriver here. I'm sorry, a uh, Allen driver. This is 1.5 mil. And you loosen all four screws here. And then you can change the angle of this guy. Okay, so to mount your camera up to this, um, what we've got, let's see if I can get this in here. What we've got is a quarter 20 slot. Okay, so you can mount quarter 20 screws. You can also take out this adapter plate. There's an adapter plate in here. And if you remove, I'll show you real quick here. If you remove these screws, Okay, this adapter plate comes out and now you've got a 3 8 16 or 3 8 that's the screw size. Uh, you've got a 3 8 slot for a 3 8 16 screw that can go into your camera. So you can do either of those. Now, what a lot of guys like to do is go ahead and mount up like a Manfrotto quick release on here. Then that way you can take your cinema camera and just quick release, you know, it's a toolless quick release. You push the button and you can take your cinema camera on and off super quick. So that's really the, the best way to, to use this mount. Uh, I want to talk about positioning of the camera. What you're trying to do when you mount your cinema camera up is you're trying to get the center of gravity of that camera to line up with the center of this anti-vibration assembly. So the center is somewhere around here. So you want to, you know, you've got a lens on there, Maybe you're running with a battery on the back of your camera, whatever situation that you've got. Try and get the centers lined up. If you've got a big long lens, let's say for instance, and you've got it sticking out here, that's a cantilevered load that's you know sitting on this anti-vibration assembly and you may get some unwanted movement or bobbling in the footage. So try and get everything centered up. And there's really lots of room so you can get things centered up. You can see the prop tip uh, for the top props is way back here. Um, the front props are completely out of the way. So you have a lot of, a lot of room to, to sort of get things centered up. And of course, as I mentioned before, you've got these slots. So you can actually loosen these screws and move the entire anti, uh, I'm sorry, the entire uh, camera mount forward and backwards to get the positioning correct on your cinema camera. Continuing on with our discussion about cinema cameras and uh, how they're going to work with your Money Shot Mini, you have the option to use this XT60 power here. There is a step down on this machine that will allow you to uh, run power to your cinema camera. So say for instance you wanted to use uh, Komodo, the red Komodo is extremely popular. It's probably what you're going to be flying on this. Uh, that requires 12 volt power. So you can get 12 volt power from here. So what you're going to need is an adapter like this. All right. We sell these adapters or you can source one yourself up to you. It's just an XT60 that runs into the uh, right angle connector that then plugs into your red. So pretty basic. What you're going to do is just plug the uh, connector in here and then you can route it through here and then plug that into the back of your cinema camera. And now you've got uh, these battery packs uh, running power through the step down and then into your cinema camera. Now you can change the voltage on that step down uh, for different voltage requirements on the camera. So say for instance, you've got a Sony and the Sony requires 16 volts. It doesn't require 12 volts, it requires 16 volts. Well now what you can do is just simply access the step down and I'll show you how to do that here. This is the step down here and you can see that there are little dip switches here and then there's a table 
that has some voltages in it and it shows you what locations these dip switches have to be to get the desired voltage out to that XT60. Okay, so this thing will put out anywhere from 7.4 all the way up to 16 volts to that XT60. It doesn't stop there. Let's say that hypothetically you had a camera that, you know, it doesn't require 14, it doesn't require 16, it requires 15 volts. Well, what do you do? Well, what you can do is select one of those voltages and then use this little pot to adjust the exact voltage out to that XD60 somewhere in between that range like 15 volts for instance. So the way that you would determine what voltage you're getting out here is just simply put a multimeter up to the two connections and adjust the pot so you can get the exact voltage out to your cinema camera. That brings a close to the video user manual for the Money Shot Mini V2 Y6. If you have any questions please email us at info at catalystmachineworks.com or support at catalystmachineworks.com. Um, we have a safety video that we are producing right now, so that will be available soon. We require that you go and watch that safety video. Uh, it is super important that you take the steps that you need to be safe while flying these. These are dangerous machines. They can, uh, they can cause property damage and injure people. And so you really have to be a professional with these. Take your time and you gotta know your stuff, okay? Uh, one thing I do wanna mention in closing is that if you don't have a lot of experience in FPV craft, if you've never flown a five inch or a seven inch, you know, if you're not an experienced FPV pilot, you really don't have any business operating one of these machines. Okay, that's just the reality of it. <laughs> so if you want to get into uh, cinema FPV, go and do your practice. Get on the simulator, uh, go buy a five inch and just flog the crap out of it. Um, learn your stuff and become proficient before ever attempting to fly something like this. So there we go. Uh, I hope the video wasn't too boring for you guys. Again, any questions, please ask.